how did the United States emerge from the Second World War as a superpower? And what makes European politics so complex but important in the United States' role as the superpower? Let's find out with our special guest in this unique episode of Friends and Fellow Citizens. Patriotism, faith, national unity, education, fiscal responsibility, civility, the values that define America. Fascinating stories and talks from America-loving patriots dedicated to preserving freedom, opportunity, and justice. Welcome to the Friends and Fellow Citizens podcast. Hello and welcome to another episode of Friends and Fellow Citizens. I'm your host, Sherman Tylosky. Thank you so much for joining us today. We've got a really great episode coming up, and we've got a great guest to help us out with a topic that I think is just so fundamentally important when it comes to dealing with uh, America and the important responsibility that she has in the entire world here. But before we get into the intro, make sure at the end of this episode that you subscribe and share this podcast with your friends and family. And now I'm joined by my great friend, Pat Yarrow. Pat is a remarkable guy, a guy whom I met back in March of 2018. We've known each other for uh, over two and a half years now, and he's just been a remarkable supporter of this podcast, and I just can't wait to hear what he has to say and share uh, with all of us. So, Pat, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on. Well, hi, Sherman. Uh, thank you for having me on your show, on your podcast. So I was born and raised in Budapest, Hungary, and I went to college there, and then I worked for big American multinational corporations in Europe. Then I moved to Texas to pursue my master's degree in international affairs. That's where I met Sherman, my great friend. It's an honor to be in his podcast today. Well, thank you so much, Pat. That really means a lot to me, and you are a great friend of mine. And it is an honor to have you on the podcast as well. I want to start our conversation today talking about the fallout of the Second World War. I feel like 1945 is kind of a good time to start our conversation today because that's really when we have a new world order. So, Pat, what was the fallout from this war and how did a new world order begin? Yes, Sherman. So you are absolutely right. The Second World War and the aftermath of the World War, the European system that was set up in the aftermath and the international system, those international institutions that were introduced in the late 1940s still define European politics and transatlantic politics. As we know, Second World War was a bloody conflict. And when it concluded in 1945, uh, most European nations realized that this terrible, terrible bloody conflict, this bloodshed should never happen again. So the entire uh, European project, post-war European project, uh, was revolving around the question how to enhance European cooperation, how to prevent any further hostilities be, be, uh, among the nations, and how to put Europe on the track of economic uh, pr prosperity. As we know, this was not the only challenge European nations had after the World War. Uh, there was a challenge from the East, the, the Soviet Union, the other uh, victorious power uh, along the United States, uh, was expanding towards Europe. And these two issues, first, making European prosperity permanent and challenging uh, Soviet expansion was the two greatest missions of post-European politics. That's a great answer, Pat. I want to move on a little bit to a subject that I think really disturbs a lot of us, and that is Antifa and the rise of Antifa. I don't think a lot of people know that Antifa gets its roots from the aftermath of the Second World War. Amidst all of the existing chaos and destruction during World War II, 
how did a force like Antifa rise from the ashes of one of the most destructive conflicts of all time? Yeah, so to go back to the economy, in 1945, 1946, uh, peace became the normal again on the European continent, but economic recovery was out of question. Production levels were down, unemployment was high, and the entire continent was in turmoil. Uh, And besides this, we saw a pattern, leftist politics, and uh, a why for leftist programs and government intervention became the normal in the late 1940s. And, you know, putting this thing back to the context of the of that era, where you have a big socialist or communist uh, country power expanding towards Europe, uh, it's not hard to put it together that these leftist politics uh, was sort of like um, were sort of like a threat towards European democracy and to the American interest. Uh, you know, uh, our, your podcast is about um, you know America, United States. Uh, and our episode, we have to talk about U.S. involvement in this. And as you mentioned, the Marshall Plan was one of the most important programs that helped Europe avoiding a leftist pattern, a leftist path, and uh, and build a modern uh, free market-based nation state and a democracy. So, the first thing I have to mention is that uh, in the late ni- in the late forties. Uh, first, the Brits uh, realized that they were not able to maintain their 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 status, both military and economic status, and their presence in in the Balkans. And they announced that they would pull out. And uh, George Marshall uh, was Secretary of State, and I guess Dean Acheson uh, was Deputy Secretary of State. And they realized immediately that this is going to be a threat. So the first thing they did uh, that under President Truman's leadership, they passed the the Greek-Turkish Aid Act, where the United States provided substantial amount of military aid uh, to to help local communist leftist uprisings and movements down, both in Turkey and both in Greece. Uh, The second thing was the the Truman Doctrine. Of course, we know Harry Truman's doctrine. basically meant that the United States would help uh, nations around the globe to fight uh, small violent minorities and Soviet expansion. Uh, And this is directly connected to the Marshall Plan. Uh, The plan named after the Secretary of State, George Marshall, provided vast amounts of economic aid to Europe to help restart the economy, to help rebuild confidence, and by the early 1950s, thanks to the United States' involvement in this, and thanks to the the, the brilliant the brilliant statesman that led Europe in the post four years, uh, managed to put Europe back on track. By 1952-1953, most of the Western countries reached pre-war production levels, and a, a huge long era of economic uh, prosperity and economic growth began. Uh, and my favorite quote from this era. So you sure? I mean, you asked me to to pick a quote from from both from uh, all of the 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 topics we're, we're covering today. My favorite quote mm-hmm. is from Harry Truman, who once said that the uh the, so actually two halves of the same walnut are the Marshall Plan and the the Truman Doctrine, which by he meant that uh, the economic aid and the military aid are both serving American interest and European interest. And I think we can all agree with him that that the United States help the United States involvement and the United States interest, to be honestly, was vital for Europe's success. Fascinating answer, Pat. Thank you so much for that. I just want to bring up a couple points here to add on to that great answer. The first is that people should realize that after the Second World War, it was sort of a bit of like a deja vu kind of situation because once again, we've seen the consequences of European countries getting into really, really big, bloody battles. And the chaos that emerges out of that is something that a lot of countries at the time, after World War II, really thought, 
look, we got to solve this problem right now. We did have some plans after World War I dealing with German reparations. There was the Dawes plan proposed by Charles Dawes. There was the Young plan that was put out uh, later in the 1920s. But neither of those plans, I think, could really work because they didn't really address the systemic factors that make a country so vulnerable to radical players. The second point I want to make is that we cannot underestimate the economy. I mean, there's that saying from Bill Clinton's campaign back in 1992, it's the economy, stupid. You know? And I think that's one of the big themes that Europeans recognize and a theme that Americans recognize as well after the Second World War. Let me ask you a bit more about the Marshall Plan. What was the Marshall Plan? What did it entail that really helped Europe come out of this mess a bit easier than perhaps one could have expected without any action whatsoever? Well, basically, before the war and uh, even after the war, in the aftermath, a lot of countries struggled with sort of the old feudal economic system. Of course, we're not talking about political feudalism because it, it had been dismantled well before uh, the 20th century. But some of the, the old structures, the old regulations, the, 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 the struggles, the hurdles uh, between inner state commerce uh, between European and uh, among European countries, uh, these were the main points the Marshall Plan addressed to ease up the economy, to ease up trade and, and commerce between European uh, member states. I want to move on now to the aftermath of the British and French empires. After World War II, it was pretty clear that both empires were going to struggle heavily, especially economically, on maintaining these empires. And it just wasn't that easy, right, to just say, all right, after a bloody conflict, let's just all get along. It was such a difficult time, wasn't it? It was difficult. And actually, the colonization stirred up domestic politics in, in both France and in the United Kingdom. So if you start off from the year 1945, most European powers still had some sort of colonial uh, footprint on the world, uh, except for the Spanish. The Spanish uh, uh, had lost their colonial empire well before uh, the Second World War, but the Portuguese, the Dutch, the British, the Belgian... And the, and the French, and the uh, little Italians too, they still had colonies around the world. Of course, the Italians, even uh, along with the Japanese, uh, because of the, uh, the, the, the loss they suffered, political and, and military loss during World War II, lost their empires right away. But for most nations, for most European powers, decolonization was a gradual process. You mentioned the Brits. Of course, they lost India in 1947. Uh, then Pakistan uh, became an independent nation, as we know, uh, from uh, seceding from India. And then colonization began in the African continent and in the Middle East. Uh, and, you know, when I said that decolonization stirred up and affected domestic politics, I mean the Suez Crisis. Uh, the Suez Crisis happened in 1956, as we know, but uh, as we know, Israel and Egypt were both, uh, the Israel, of course, the, the state of Israel was an independent state since its declaration, but it was established on the British Mandate of Palestine, and as we know, Egypt had been under British rule, so the... the uh, the incapability of the British uh, government to deal with the Suez crisis on the soil of its former colonies uh, made Anthony Eden to resign. And, uh, you know, it, it, uh, it ended in a government crisis back in London. So, as you, as you said, uh, decolonization had an impact on British politics. Uh, at least we talk about the French. The French uh, had main, two main problems during decolonization, uh, first one in Indochina, uh, which, as we know, unfortunately, uh, had, a, had a big problem, and it re resulted in a big problem for the United States later on in the 60s, and the second in, in Algeria. Uh, and as for Algeria, the Algerian war actually ended the, the Fourth French Republic, and it, 
let General de Gaulle come back into power and establish the Fifth Republic. So, as you've mentioned, as you said, decolonization was vital in those post-war years, in the first 10, 15 years for these big powers, and it affected their domestic politics a lot, not only in the sense that their governments uh, suffered political setbacks, but after decolonization, a lot of former residents of these colonies started to migrate to the to the, the parent nations, to the, the colonial powers centers, to London, to Paris, to Brussels. And this started to, to change the demographics of, of Europe. Absolutely. The Suez crisis for me has been such a watershed moment. When people ask when the United States really started accelerating as a, a global power. I think when the, that happened, you know, the decolonization started for the UK and France, uh, whereas for the United States, you know, we didn't have to really do that, uh, right, as a, a global power. And that was a perfect opportunity for us to take over and be ahead of the competition, essentially. I'd say that uh, President Eisenhower was such a genius when he came up with this idea of of being able to kind of pit uh, you know the Soviets and the British a little bit uh, during the Suez crisis. And unfortunately, it cost uh, Prime Minister Eden his job. Uh, but it's such an important moment there, and I think it's certainly worth reflecting as we kind of progress through history and we think about what the role of the United States was during the Cold War. Before we get into the next segment, we are going to take a brief 20-second break, so you can pause this episode and take whatever break you like. We'll come back and we'll begin with our second segment. So don't go away. We'll be right back. And welcome back. We've got Pat back here as well. And now we're going to talk a bit about the upheavals that occurred after all this conflict and the Marshall Plan and all the rest. Pat, I want to go into the economic restructuring of Europe because it just doesn't take a simple policy or two to start the economy again. I mean, this was a new idea and a new vision for how Europe was essentially going to be run. Tell us a little bit more about the beginnings of this restructuring and how that impacted European politics in the 50s, 60s, and beyond. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so as we discussed before, uh, one of the main tasks and one of the main challenges European leaders had and faced in the aftermath of World War II was to prevent another uh, catastrophe like uh, World War II happening and to, and, to, and to create an economic environment that would serve millions of Europeans in the decades to come. And the first thing, the first major thing that happened was uh, a steel and coal cooperation among European states, European nations. And uh, the first uh, the first pillar, what we later call European integration, the first major pillar was the, the Treaty of Rome in 1957, when six countries, Belgium, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, West Germany, uh, France, and Italy, uh, established the European Economic Community. The European Economic Community, which was a customs union uh, with the purpose of of eventually becoming a single market. As we know, uh, in integration of um, states, we have five different uh, levels. The first is free trade areas, then member states agree on on a tariff-free trade between between themselves. The second layer is the 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 customs union, then there is free trade between the members, but the members. Uh, establish and uh, maintain a common uh, tariff to third-party members. So outside of their zone, the member states do not pursue 
separate uh, customs and tariff policies. The third layer is the is the single market when in the in the given area among member states the movement of labor capital and uh, and resources is free uh, and the fourth layer is an economic union and the fifth is a political union so the european nations decided back in the late 50s that they need they need to uh they need to start a process in order to federalize the European continent. That was the eventual goal, and it's still a goal today because, as we know, because of history and culture, it's not as easy. Uh, but as, as you said correctly, uh, the Marshall Plan helped to establish and to break down old uh, barriers. Then European nations had to take uh, responsibility and take the lead and start European integration towards the European Union, which later become the European Union. Very well said, Pat. Uh, I want to bring up a, a very famous quote uh, that Churchill used uh, back in uh, 1946. So Churchill was giving a speech at the University of Zurich in Switzerland. Uh, he delivered this on September 19, 1946. This is what Churchill said, quote, We must build a kind of United States of Europe. In this way, only will hundreds of millions of toilers be able to regain the simple joys and hopes which make life worth living, unquote. I think that quote uh, to me, and we'll talk about this a bit more at the end of the podcast here, episode here, uh, but it, it seems like uh, you know, Churchill was bringing up an issue that I think to this day is still being debated because you know, what does the United States of Europe mean? I think that on the one hand, someone could argue that you know uh, Europe needs to be united by the economy and the economy only. So you need to have an economic union. Some people say that the United States of Europe has to be a bit like the United States of America, where you have this kind of you know one. Not, not necessarily one, in terms of one country, but uh, certainly uh, one system that kind of acts like a country. So there's multiple ways of see, seeing this, uh, but I just want to bring that quote up because I think it's, it's such an important quote. And it's something that I always refer back to whenever we talk about these debates of what Europe should look like, what Europe could have looked like, et cetera. Uh, now, now, Pat, uh, you know, you know, I think when you really touched upon some of these basic things. And again, in a future episode, we love to kind of dig deeper into the European Union itself here, right? Uh, but uh, let's just shift a little bit here to, to uh, kind of the basic political history of some major countries like the UK, France, Italy, and Germany. Um, could, you, could you kind of walk us through a little bit of how these countries behaved politically uh, after this uh, creation of uh, the European uh, community and the, and the Marshall Plan and all that, that it all occurred in the 50s, and how that contributed to uh, some of the early beginnings of what we now know as uh, the European Union. Yeah, so after, after World War II, most countries on the continent uh, managed to establish or reestablish Christian democratic moderate parties and social democratic parties. And uh, the tendency was, interestingly, back in the 50s, in the late 40s and 50s, and even in the 60s, these Christian democratic parties were culturally center-right, but economically sort of like center-left. Uh, so they were like more like a Christian social, uh, favoring big government programs, favoring universal health care, uh, favoring trade unions, supporting trade union causes. But basically, uh, this thing happened within the framework of a free market economy and with the help of the Marshall Plan and later on with the European Economic Community, uh, Western Europe managed to reach and maintain uh, solid economic growth up until the 1970s when, of course, the oil crisis hit and, and other economic uh, problems affected badly the global economy. And related to this, most European countries managed to uh, establish steady political systems too. So the United Kingdom was a little bit um, an outlier because post for Britain was not as successful economically uh, as Germany or France or uh, the Benelux countries or even Italy. But yet Britain could establish stable, like British democracy had been stable as we know 
but they managed to to um, to sail through the decades without major political major political crises. As we know, after right, right after World War II, the Labour Party uh, won an election in 1945 uh, with Clement Attlee becoming prime minister. Uh, but after his fall, uh, basically, except for the few uh, exceptions, the Conservative Party managed to govern the United Kingdom. And the ma- one of the major pro- uh, programs and projects they could, uh, they could fulfill was to join the European Economic Community in the 1970s. Uh, as for France, as I mentioned before, um, the Fourth Republic collapsed uh, in the 1950s as a result of the Algerian War, and General Charles de Gaulle established the, the Fifth French Republic with a, a semi-presidential form of government. And this uh, form of government still uh, is still exists in, in France, which is sort of like a big achievement because the French tend to, to change their governments, their system of government frequently, as we know. Ever since the French Revolution, they had many transitions, many regime changes, but the Fifth Republic was stable. It has been stable, uh, and normally it's it's been run by center-left parties, except for the, uh, the presidency of François Mitterrand and uh, François Hollande. Um, French French democracy had been defined by uh, by the governing majority of of, of center right parties. As for Italy, uh, the political system there uh, had been stable, but with a lot of internal turmoil. So there were because of the electoral system and the political culture of Italy, uh, there's there had been a lot of political parties, and these parties formed. Uh, multi-party governing coalitions in order to to be able to to set up a, uh, an administration, and they allocated the ministerial seats among them. And uh, because of this system, uh, the the government and the prime minister's uh, position was pretty pretty unstable. Uh, normally, most governments could not serve uh, more than two years out of a four five year term, uh, but yet. During these decades of economic, oh, sorry, these decades of political instability, uh, Italy managed to achieve huge economic advancement, uh, and it helped to, it, this helped to, 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 uh, to establish the, the democratic model after decades of fascism, as we know. As for Germany, we also saw the the dominance of the Christian Democratic Party. And it's it's a sister party, the Christian Socialist Union in Bavaria. Uh, this uh, party uh, has been defined German politics since 1949 with the first chancellor Konrad Adenauer. Uh, it has governed Germany uh, in coalition governments m- most of the times with the the Liberal Party, the FDP. Uh, in a few cases with the uh, the Social Democratic Party, the SDP, and there was only one uh, occasion in 1957 when the the Christian Democrats managed to gain, managed to win uh, an absolute majority in the in the Bundestag in the German legislature, and this was of this was the result of Adenauer's 1955 trip to Moscow when he managed to get all the POWs back from the the Soviets and the German electorate. Uh, was so overwhelmed, so happy, and so uh, honored by Adenauer's, Adenauer's achievement that they granted him absolute majority. But this was a, an outlier. This was a sole occasion. Normally, German politics is led by the Christian Democrats in partnership with smaller parties. Very well said, Pat. I just want to note that from a U.S. perspective, it's quite a strange feeling to read about systems with multiple parties. And we look at places like Italy and France and Spain and even the UK to some degree, and you compare that to the two-party system, it just feels so different because you're looking at coalition building in other countries. A lot more coalition building is based on essentially how a government can function. Uh, Without coalition building, you can't really have governments in many countries in Europe. 
I want to move now a bit more to about other countries and how they impacted the way Europe has gone over the last few decades. We did have some additional countries join in, right? Yeah, exactly. So these are uh, the countries I, I was talking about were very pro free market free market democracy. They were like liberal democracies with uh, modern Western ideas. They were basically pro USA. Maybe France was a little bit of an outlier, uh, but uh, they were like the good guys. They were the 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 engines of European cooperation. But we had a few bad examples and a few bad countries that didn't follow this path right after World War II. We still had fascist Spain, led by Francisco Franco. We had Estado Novo, um, the, the country uh, of Portugal, led by uh, Solazar, Salazar, uh, who was later uh, succeeded by Cayetano. And we had also Greece, uh, which had a military junta in the 1970s. Uh, but thanks God, these countries managed to, uh, to, to, to bring down these dictatorial regimes. And by the mid-late 1970s, they were managed to join European integration, the European Economic Community, and all three countries embarked on a, on a path to economic prosperity, as the other Western countries did. Pat, I think what you just said is absolutely important to our understanding of how Europe builds itself as it progresses into the 21st century. While the United States does have different histories for different states, depending on whether or not a state like, for example, Texas used to be its own country for a few years, whereas other states were part of bigger territories like the Louisiana uh, Territory, uh, and Florida used to be part of the Spanish, et cetera. So we have different histories, but I think the histories, when you line up the histories of different countries in Europe and the histories in diff of different states in the United States, it's like comparing apples to oranges. That's one of the things I really want the audience to get today is that when we, when we talk in the future about how European countries deal with different issues, especially nowadays with a much larger European Union now, now, it's important to get to the facts and understand where people are coming from with their approach to how Europe should look like as we progress in the next few years and the next few decades. Now let's move on to the Eastern Bloc. The Eastern Bloc is certainly a very interesting part of history, especially when you look at the alliances that the United States has built with some of these former Soviet Union states. Pat, tell us about how the Eastern Bloc has changed over the last few decades, because we're still dealing with some of the aftermath of the fall of the Soviet Union, aren't we? Exactly, Sherman. So uh, up to this point, we were talking about the, the success stories of Europe. Uh, the northern countries, and later on the southern Mediterranean countries. But there was an Eastern Europe too, and there still is an Eastern Europe. And on the, the eastern side of the Iron Curtain, there were several countries uh, that suffered under Soviet oppression. So interesting, right after World War II, uh, the Soviets did not uh, establish communist-type regimes right away. It was a gradual process of four or five years uh, until... Uh, the communists and the allies of the Kremlin managed to uh, to establish power, complete power over these nations. And uh, interesting thing is that in the West, uh, the communist movement had very big support. As we know, in Italy, the communists almost won power, almost won the election in 1947, if I remember correctly. Uh, there was a a uh, strong communist movement in France, and you know, we know about the, the strength of British uh, labor unions. But in the West, maybe because of underdevelopment and the still the big reliance on agriculture, the, the labor movement, the, the socialist, social democratic communist movement was not as, uh, not as popular. But still, uh, the communists uh, managed to establish power, as I said, by the early 1950s, by coercion, by salami tactics. 
but the peoples of Eastern Europe didn't like it. These countries were excluded from the Marshall Plan, so there was no economic recovery, there was political oppression, and the first time, the first time Eastern Europeans said no, we can't let this happen to us anymore, it was in 1956, when when the Poles uh, started an uprising. By the way, the Poles were really active throughout communism. They, they especially the labor labor movement, uh, as we know later on, solidarity became their biggest movement. But the Poles uh, carried out several uprisings throughout these decades. Uh, but in the same year, in 1956, in October, the Hungarians toppled the, the, the communist regime in Budapest. Uh, they toppled Stalin's ally, and they established uh, um, uh, a, democratic, a democratic type of government, but the revolution was toppled by Soviet intervention. And of course, as we know, this was just uh, in the weeks of the Suez crisis, so the United States and the Western powers had no means to intervene in Hungary. That would have, that would have led to a catastrophe, as we know, two major nuclear powers uh, meeting in Hungary with military. Uh, unfortunately, this was a, 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 an imperfect timing for the revolution, but it was the first time when Eastern Europeans said that, no, we don't want this. Uh, the second time uh, Eastern Europeans revolted was 1968 when Alexander Dubček became uh, the first secretary of the, the Czech Communist, the Czech Slovak Communist Party. And he started to implement major reforms to liberalize the economy, to liberalize the political system. But uh, this movement was trashed. Uh, Brezhnev ordered Soviet troops to, to topple and remove Dubček from power. And actually, Brezhnev put together a coalition of several Eastern European countries. And the last thing is the, the solidarity in 1980, when with the, with the leadership of, of President, later President Valesa, uh, the Poles uh, started an anti-government movement, which was not toppled by Soviet intervention, but the local Soviet Communist Party realized that if they don't intervene, then Moscow will will send in tanks again and preventing this uh, Jaruzelski he was a general in the in the in the communist army of Poland uh, took over and he imposed martial law and he governed uh, Poland up until the late 19, 1980s I remember a couple years ago I went to Budapest a beautiful city really remarkable place I guess I kind of fit in there because everyone there thought I spoke Hungarian. So, uh, but there you go. Uh, I went there and I saw a lot of Soviet art, and the art just differed so much from the old art that we all love to appreciate. And I asked my friend about it, and he just said that this was a solemn reminder of the difficulties and the challenges and the ugliness of communism that grew in that part of the world. I talk a lot about how. Different parts of the world have ups and downs, but I think in a place like that, there were not that many ups. And I think my friend was just telling me how fortunate he was to be able to live in a much different country now, now that it's moved on at least a bit more, a lot more than what it used to be. Next, I want to turn to something before we get into our second break here. Uh, let's talk about the collapse of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of the Soviet Union. I think all of us are very familiar with what happened there and the fall of uh, communism and the fall of the bipolar world system. So what happened with the series of events that occurred in the late 80s and in the early 90s that led to such a rapid and significant transformation of global power. Yeah, so as we know, the, the communist uh, oppression of, of Eastern Europe ended in the late 1980s. And this was, uh, it was, this was uh, uh, a consequence of several things. Uh, first, the, the internal weakness of, the, of the, the socialist economy. Second, the brilliance of Ronald Reagan uh, and the United States uh, by making the Soviet Union uh, pursuing uh, an ambitious 
uh, military program, as we know, Star Wars plan and uh, the the trick the United States uh, managed to, to pull on the Soviets. And uh, there was also political change uh, in the Kremlin. So in 1986, or 85, Mikhail Gorbachev became uh, the general secretary of the, the Communist Party, so leader of the Soviet Union, leader of the Eastern Bloc, and he was a very reform-minded politician. So all these factors together uh, eventually uh, led to the, the fall of the Berlin Wall, which is, of, of course, symbolic uh, that the wall dividing East Germany and West Germany went down. And from this point on, with the leadership of the United States, uh, all these countries went through quick political transitions. The communist parties were toppled, mostly by uh, peaceful transitions. In a few cases, like in Romania, the, the dictator was... was uh, was removed by violent means, but generally these transitions went smoothly and all these countries managed to set up uh, independent, free, democratic systems of government. And I cannot emphasize enough the involvement of the United States and both Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush in this because the European, the European leaders, both Margaret Thatcher and François Mitterrand, were not so keen on seeing uh, these countries moving towards freedom so quickly. And they had a point. It was risky. We know what happened after the after Yugoslavia was dissolved. Uh, we saw what happened in a few cases, like in Slovakia, when authoritarian type politicians managed to, to, to gain power quickly after a transition. But generally, we can say with hindsight that the project of... of liberating these countries and helping these countries towards European and, and North Atlantic integration was successful. As Pat will know, when we were students at the Bush School, uh, we always walked past this incredible sculpture. This sculpture is called The Day the Wall Came Down. It's a sculpture by Verrill Goodnight. Uh, it was sculpted, I believe, in 1996. Uh, I think it was initially placed in Stone Mountain Park, just outside of Atlanta, for the 1996 Olympic Games. And then in 1997, it was moved to the grounds of the Bush School and the George H.W. Bush Presidential Library Museum. And you can still check it out when you visit uh, College Station. And I really encourage exactly. people to take a look. Fascinating. It's five horses leaping over actual pieces of the Berlin Wall. It's just fascinating, fascinating artwork. I believe there's a second one in Germany. I believe it's in Berlin, uh, in the former American sector of that city. Uh, so if you do get a chance to check out at least one of those pieces, definitely do so. So that's the end of our second segment. We're going to take a quick 20-second break. You can pause this episode and take a break as long as you want resume here we'll be back in 20 seconds with our final segment and then our wrap-up and reflection part of our podcast don't go away too far and too long we'll be back right after this And welcome back to our final segment in today's episode about European and transatlantic relations. Pat, now that we're through the history and the overview of the development of the European continent, I want to now get into a bit more about the European Union. Now, it's not a perfect system and no system is but it seems like there were a few things within the system especially on the economic side that would certainly pose some good outcomes perhaps on economic growth but the politics of the European Union seems to be somewhat of an issue when it comes to ensuring the integrity of the union that it's supposed to protect. Yeah, so as we uh, started off from the 1940s, 
we saw we were talking about independent European nation states and their project to cooperate. But as of the 2020s and actually starting off since the 1990s, uh, people more and more refer to to the European Union. Uh, of course, European integration started back in the 1950s. Uh, it became deeper, uh, but uh, and it became bigger in the sense that more and more countries were admitted to the European uh, Economic uh, Community, to the United Europe. But in 1992, two years after the, the the Soviet Union fell, the Maastricht Treaty set up the European Union, which was more like... Um, and political union and uh, an economic union. Of course, it was not a full union in the sense of United, the, in the sense of the United States or the United Arab Republic, which we saw in the Middle East. It was more like an other, another step toward federal Europe. But as we know, uh, the, the transitions uh, happened, and the new member states uh, started to integrate into Europe and into the North Atlantic in terms of relations with the United States and NATO. But uh, there was a big difference between their advancement and the advancement of the old European countries back in back after uh, World War II. And the main difference was econo- economics. Uh, these Eastern European former communist countries were not able to, to carry out such an economic miracle uh, as other former uh, oppressive, former totalitarian countries could after uh, they changed their system uh, after World War II. And it seems like that this problem defines European politics today. Uh, we, see, uh, people, uh, we see countries going on uh, a track of authoritarianism like Poland and Hungary. And we see problems within European cooperation, within the European integration, due to the, the, uh, the appearance of these new countries. Speaking of European integration, I would love to do episodes on Brexit because Brexit in many ways is a symbol of Britain as a bit of an awkward partner in Europe. We can go into detail so much about what makes the UK so unique uh, in terms of its role in Europe, but uh, we'll leave that to another episode. But I just want to get that out there and just make sure that people get that Britain was a very awkward partner. And there's just so many crazy things that have happened just back and forth between Britain and the continent. I'd like to share a real quick story here. I think this was about a couple years ago, two or three years ago, I was standing on the platform waiting for uh, the train. This was at a subway station in London. And I'm standing on the platform and I see this ad for some kind of travel agency or some kind of airline. And they were saying on the poster, fly to Europe for whatever number of euros. And I thought to myself, you know, that's funny because I am in Europe. But of course, what they were implying was continental Europe. And I think that's a bit of a symbolic poster in itself. I mean, that's that wasn't really the intent of the advertisement, but it is quite a bit of a symbolic poster there that reflects a bit of, uh, about how independent the UK has shown to be. And of course, it, it is very dependent on the European continent, but I'm just saying that uh, the differences between the continent and the country can certainly be very obvious uh, when you look into the history between uh, the country and the continent, especially during the Thatcher years, especially uh, during the uh, Cameron years, David Cameron uh, premiership uh, that ended a few years ago. Despite all of the reforms and the additions and the new members, the new levels of bureaucracy, etc., one thing is absolutely clear, which is how is Europe going to reform itself? Because there's so many issues ranging from the refugee crisis to the economic crisis to uh, inequality to immigration, etc. All these issues need to be resolved, but they need to be resolved soon. Otherwise, we're going to be seeing additional pockets of 
uprisings and discontent that no one really wants. But Europe reforming Europe seems to be the big stumbling block. Yeah, so as I mentioned, the European project began in the 1950s, and the ECC uh, was set up for six countries, six rich, basically rich Western European countries. Uh, Italy is like uh, more like Southern Europe, but still, they caught up real fast. And throughout the decades, the European project put a lot of emphasis on expanding the 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 so-called union. Of course, we have only called union since 1990, since 1992. But they put a lot of emphasis on expanding horizontally, but not vertically. Uh, they did not put enough effort on deepening ties, on creating and maintaining the structures to, to govern the, uh, the club of more and more states. And as the, the Brits and the, the Danes entered in the early 70s, and then the, uh, the, the Spanish, the Portuguese, and the Greece also joined the club, Austria in 1999, and of course, in 04, we had a big expansion when a lot of former, most of the former uh, the former Soviet states from Eastern Europe uh, uh, were admitted to the Union. And uh, this brought a new uh, challenge to Brussels. What to do with these econ- economies that were lagging behind Western Europe by decades? Uh, how to integrate the culturally different people into the European culture. So all these things, all these factors added up. And of course, the financial uh, turmoil came, the financial crisis came in a way. And uh, then the Europeans realized that there is one major problem, uh, another major problem they were not allowed, not able to, to, to address, and that's money, that's monetary issues. So as we know, the Treaty of Maastricht uh, proposed um, the creation of an economic union, a monetary union, more precisely, uh, with a single currency, the euro. And the euro was introduced later on. Uh, the problem was that uh, even though the even though central banking, so monetary policy, was um, united, uh, it's ran by the European Central Bank in Frankfurt. But fiscal policy was not taken all over by Brussels. It wasn't taken over by the European uh, government. And this created a lot of problems when the Eurozone crisis hit in 2009 and 2010. A lot of countries had a huge national debt, uh, and there was no means for Brussels to, to, to keep a check on these countries. And uh, even today, this problem is still with us in Europe. And I think this will be the next major task Europeans will have to, to figure out is how to how do you make sure that the same countries uh, with I mean countries with the same economic cultural uh, and um, and political systems uh, are able to cooperate and thrive because we can we have to admit that there is a big difference among European nations and unless Unless Europe uh, sets up a smart, efficient system, the European p- project will be in jeopardy. It will be, it will be in trouble. I was just looking at some figures on GDP growth for the United States and Europe. Uh, for the United States, you know, we saw some periods of growth, especially on certain quarters, right around 2013, 2014 or so, where we've had 3 4 even 5% growth in a quarter. And a, a year after year growth, we've seen numbers ranging from about you know 1 and 1 1 and a half percent up to about I think about 2% or so. Uh, I think before the pandemic and all that, uh, we've seen some pretty great numbers economically speaking. In terms of economic growth from the United States here, we're looking at something between 2 to 3%. And I, th- I really hope that we can go even further, especially uh, if reopening can come sooner and the virus is under control uh, and we can allow the economy to spring back again. 
I looked at the European numbers a bit, and yes, there was recovery. And when you look at certain countries, obviously it's going to depend on whom you're talking about here. You know, when you talk about Germany, that's a very different story than when it comes to Spain or Italy. Uh, and it seems like the economic hit on Europe was somewhere along the lines of about 4%, I believe. I'll have to check the numbers in another time. Uh, but I looked at the rates of growth over the, the past decade from 2010 to 2020. And there's some numbers out there that just aren't impressive. You know, 1% of growth is not impressive. Just something to consider, I think. Now let's turn a bit into the crises that have spurred this con- discontent. One particular crisis that I can remember, certainly as someone who just started college uh, at that time back in September of 2015, that was the refugee crisis. It seems like the, the, a lot of these crises are occurring uh, with little to no damage control, especially on the political side of things when you've got populist parties uh, coming out because there's been a, a, a there's a bit of a kind of a political vacuum in terms of whether or not things are getting solved. Well, uh, the refugee crisis definitely affected the the political development of the EU. And uh, I have to go back to the Treaty of Maastricht. Or we can go back to the Treaty of Lisbon, which is, of course, a later treaty. It's it kind of steered Europe towards uh, a more more of like a political union, but still it it failed to address major major issues that Europeans should tackle unanimously uh, as a group of countries: its border security, its intelligence, its national security matters. We are talking about. And uh, even if you go back to uh, the the eurozone crisis, which was a fiscal fiscal problem, the national security crises uh, and health crises right now, if you talk about the the COVID nineteen pandemic, uh, made it clear made people realize that the European project uh, is far from perfect. Uh, the the national government or the lack of national government is a major problem. And uh, the different approaches and the different interests of European states during the refugee crisis or now during the coronavirus crystallizes the people that uh, whenever problems strike, whenever major, major problems need to be tackled, there is no leadership. There is no united Europe anymore. And I think this is one of the, 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 the factors that contributed to to the British results in 2016. Well, you can be sure that we're going to be doing an episode on Brexit, because that's certainly one of the things that I had to really become an expert on when I was back in college. I think what you said about leadership is so significant, especially nowadays. And nowadays, we have quite a bit of polarization going on here in the United States, as well as even abroad. And without leadership... Nothing can get done. And I think good leaders have to recognize the challenges of navigating people through what I believe is a toxic political environment. And good leaders require good followers as well. So we all have a responsibility, in my opinion, uh, to lead or to support the leaders who are looking for those opportunities and windows for decent change something that we're going to explore in a lot more detail in another episode. Before we started talking about the episode today, Pat, uh, you wanted to bring up a bit more about uh, Poland and Hungary. Some of us or many of us have heard of the kinds of things that have been happening in those uh, countries and other countries as well, especially on the recent uh, constitutional moves from the uh, Hungarian Prime Minister, Viktor Orban. Walk us through your perspective on how things are going on the ground there with respect to the political climate and anything that you like to add that would be of value for us who might not understand as much about what is happening there. Well, so you're right. Um, And Europe is in turmoil. And it has been in constant turmoil 
uh, because it's a it's a, a huge challenge to bring all these countries together and to set up a working government for uh, for every nation state and for every citizen. It's impossible. And on the Western side of Europe, the anti-Eurosceptic, anti-EU movement that culminated in in the Brexit vote in 2016 uh, did not change the internal domestic political system of the UK. Of course, we're talking about an old, the oldest democracy uh, in the world. But the British made a decision to leave the club and pursue a different road. On the eastern side, on the eastern side of, of the EU, we see countries uh, that joined uh, the club uh, more recently than the Brits in 04. And of course, in a couple of years, the crisis struck. Uh, economic prosperity uh, didn't happen. Uh, they didn't manage to, to catch up with the, the, the old members of the union. And what we see now is that several countries, but mainly Poland and Hungary, this country's political system is shifting towards totalitarian regimes where populist leaders exploit people's grievances, uh, people's disappointment, and economic problems. So this is something definitely has to be uh, addressed on a European level. But the problem is, again, that as with all major serious crises, uh, the EU has no common policy. We only see national interests dominating, the German interest, the French interest, the Dutch interest, the Italian interest. And uh, unfortunately, this approach, this attitude of, of, of the countries that should be leading this project uh, is, is not adequate to, to, to tackle these problems. And I think the Brexit phenomenon was not uh, the last thing we see in this matter. I think uh, maybe not as explicit as the the British uh, the British uh, res- the, the British response to the European problems, but more and more more and more outliers, more and more radical parties, more and more politicians or peoples uh, will show their disappointment through different channels, through different means. You know, we've been talking a lot about the fractured nature of the European Union. I just want to put out there that I think countries like the United States want to have a united Europe. Now, what that looks like, of course, is completely up for debate, and there's multiple ways and permutations and combinations that you can think of on a united Europe. But I think one of the things that really attracts Americans to uh, parts of the European Union is really the economic aspect. And we want to trade with Europe. We have to depend on uh, the European Union member states for a number of imports and exports. It's true that the European Union has its own trade expectations when they trade with the United States and the rest of the world. And it's the same with us. But hopefully in the future, we can find some more commonality when it comes to the values of free trade and free enterprise. In spite of the internal divisions within the European Union and what Americans and others think about what Europe should look like and how Europe should function, do you think that the United States and Europe really have a lot more in common than what people think? Amidst all the disagreements about different interests, national interests, different economic interests, security interests, and others, there's always going to be a need for Western countries to find the common ground and fight the enemies that are much bigger than the kind of internal disputes that we have in our political systems. This is a good question, Sherman. I think there are the United States and Europe share many common interests. And of course, the United States and the EU are also main competitors. But also, given the fact that there is no common EU foreign policy, or there is no common European national security policy, we see extremely strong, uh, extremely strong ties between the US and some European countries. And we see a weakening or not perfect relationship between some European countries and the United States. So I think it is it is hard to it is hard to 
to to answer the question that is uh, there's a transatlantic divide or is there is no transatlantic divide i think uh if we address this issue uh through the lens of of geopolitics we can see that the, the two continents the two countries so to say uh the eu and the us of course the eu is not a country but it should be regarded as a country in this sense have a lot of similar uh goals that have similar cultural traits but also we have to admit that uh there are conflicts between the two sides and in the in the years to come leaders on both sides of the atlantic will need to address these problems Well, we'll certainly look out for those disagreements, and it'll be very interesting to talk about those different areas of agreements and disagreements in future episodes as we grow the podcast, as we get more guests on the show. So definitely stay tuned for that. And now we're going to enter our final part of our episode, which is a reflection of our conversation over the last hour plus, and to apply the principles of George Washington and the founders to this topic and how we can proceed as voters, as activists, as those who may want, may want to be uh, political leaders or some other uh, kind of role in our society today. So the six values that we reflect on every single episode involve patriotism, faith, national unity, education, fiscal responsibility, and civility. Pat, with those six principles in mind, which of them do you believe are especially useful when it comes to talking about European politics and transatlantic relations as it relates to the current atmosphere nowadays? Yeah, exactly, Sherman. So I think the wisdom the founding fathers and, and, and George Washington had was extraordinary, given the fact that they uh, they lived uh, more than 200 years ago without the knowledge of 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 the, of the knowledge we have and politicians in our time have. It's extremely, extremely incredible. So what I want to say is that uh, Europeans should really consider a few of of George Washington's principles like faith. Uh, without faith, uh, it's impossible to, to to preserve Europe culturally. It's impossible to to realize that uh, a government, either state or national government, is extremely vital to 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 to, uh, to provide the basic civil liberties to 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 people. It's not. It's this is not only about a science thing, political science and history, uh, but faith should be vital. Fiscal responsibility. We talked about the eurozone crisis, and unfortunately, the United States also has problems recently with fiscal responsibility. But Europeans need to understand that without uh, without balancing uh, expenditure and revenue. Uh, the project will fail, uh, both on the state level and the national level. The Greeks, the French, the Italians, they all experienced problems like this in the last couple of years. Uh, I just want to wish that in the future, if the European central government will ever get, get the power uh, to grow its budget even more, it will take fiscal responsibility uh, extremely seriously. And I also want to mention patriotism. So in Europe, one of the basic and most fierce debates is how the EU should should proceed. Nationalist forces uh, argue that because of patriotism, uh, it's unacceptable to give up power on the state level and to let a central government in Brussels uh, run Europe. Other people say that because the European interests suggest that a strong European national government and a strong United Union is the only way Europe can compete with other powers, either it's the United States or Russia or China, uh, 
I just want to say that patriotism should be there in everybody. Patriotism should be not used against your political opponents. I think people should sit down, talk, and accept that giving up power on the state level uh, is not necessarily unpatriotic. If you serve your own country, if you serve your own country's interest uh, through doing so, I think that should be fine. Yes, certainly coming from a patriotic country myself, you know, I've never really understood, at least from a young age, why people couldn't be patriotic. I mean, it's one thing to be patriotic and to fight for your country's interests and industries and people, but that's not the same as a jingoism, right? Or just ultra nationalistic people who don't take into consideration the different landscape of different interests. And there's kind of a bit of an inherent feeling on that end where people feel like they're inherently superior than other countries. And that's not what we should be looking at when we fight for patriotic values. On the fiscal responsibility principle, I would add the buck passing that's happening in Brussels and other governments in Europe. I mean, where does the buck stop when it comes to a member state perhaps making the bad decisions on a fiscal spending? Some might wonder, why should member state A be paying for member state B for fiscal mistakes if member A had little to no- had nothing or nothing to do with what member state B did. That's something to think about. And it's not just on spending. It's also on developing a political and economic system where more constituencies can have a say in Brussels. Now, that's very challenging. It's a tall order to reach. But that's going to be a challenge that has to be met. Otherwise, we're going to increasingly see more and more blocks of constituencies not being represented perhaps as much as we want to. And that could potentially be a problem for political stability in the European continent. I think great fiscal responsibility is going to be reappearing a lot in our episodes because only with good responsibility with our money matters in society, can we ensure that future generations do not have to pay off the debts that we leave them? I think there's a lot of talk, especially from politicians, to say that we need to ensure that future generations can be as prosperous. Well, if we're adding endless debt to them, that's not really helping them, is it? So just something to keep in mind, I think, when we proceed through these episodes. And I think this is certainly a topic that's very much long overdue uh, in our conversations about economics and about fiscal spending and other issues that deal with the management efficiency and allocation of our resources. One final question before we get to kind of our fun question that I always like to ask our guests, and that is, what can people do to apply the principles of faith, fiscal responsibility, and patriotism that you just talked about? Well, I think, and this applies to both Americans and Europeans and everybody who wishes to live in a free society, in a democratic government, that uh, we have to realize that that's a fact that we had extremely brilliant founding fathers and generals and people who fought for our freedoms. But we need to understand that you need to fight for freedom constantly. It's not that that in 1776, uh, people rose up, people uh, took up arms, and the brilliant uh, leaders of the society drafted a constitution and set up a brilliant government. Yes, it happened. But people need to put into effort on maintaining democracy and in civil liberties constantly. And the same applies to Europe. Yes, World War II was a long time ago. Yes, I agree that the European projects began in the 1950s and great leaders like Chancellor Adenauer and Charles de Gaulle contributed to the success of the European continent. 
but we have to understand that we need to take sacrifice and we need to put into effort to maintain and and to make to maintain democracy and to make it more perfect every single day so uh, fear fiscal woes fiscal fears should not disable people to see to see that yes it's a constant fight it's not just a thing in history that we need to commemorate yes we have to do that but it's not enough we need to we need to put into effort every single day i think that's why we need to think about washington's principles uh, whenever we think about our democracy whenever we think about our country because without these we cannot preserve we cannot preserve the brilliant freedom we have right now one of my favorite quotes is from Ronald Reagan. He said, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. So true. You're absolutely right, Pat. We got to fight for freedom every single day. And we can all do our part to be able to participate in our civic world, in our civic participation forms. And we can do so by practicing what the founders taught us, civility, about national unity, about finding new ways to talk with people, even people whom we might disagree with. That's the way we go about fixing the issues that matter most and how we can heal what is now a very divided political environment. And now one final question before we wrap up our episode today. Pat, who is your favorite founding father and why? Oh, well, it's a hard question. I think all of them were brilliant minds, all of them. And I respect all of them for, for, for their brilliance, for the, 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 brave, the bravery, the effort they had. But given this time we have right now, and given my experience coming from Hungary, and given the fact that we're talking about Europe on this episode, I would say that James Madison is my favorite uh, founding father and the most relevant. And the reason why is because of the Federalist Papers, because of the fact that Madison, Madison really pushed for checks and balances. And checks and balances are the the single most important factors I miss in European democracies. In Europe, unfortunately, the majority still can have uh, too much power on, on in government and on society. And I think what Madison said in the Federalist Paper number one, uh, Federalist Paper number fifty one, sorry, in seventeen eighty eight, uh, that. It's really important to, to, to prevent the tyranny of majority. I think this should be the thing that Europeans should be looking at whenever the European project will move into a new, a next phase of, of, uh, of creating a stronger federal government, or even when we're talking about state governments, uh, national governments in Europe, checks and balances are important. And they should be extremely important for lawmakers, for people who uh, deal with constitutional matters. I think medicine is 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 a uh, is medicine should be a role model for everybody. Excellent choice, Pat. James Madison really was quite an intellect, and if you haven't had a chance to go to Montpelier in rural Virginia, you should absolutely go. It's a phenomenal place, and you can, I think it's one of the most underrated parts of not just the United States, but of the world because of how influential Madison was as he was living in that part of the country. Well, Pat, thank you so much for joining on the show. This has been an incredible, incredible interview. We've gone almost an hour and 20 minutes and you have done a remarkable job going through decades of history in Europe, it's just not easy. It's not an easy thing to do, and I really commend you for doing so. That'll wrap up our episode today. Be sure to share and subscribe this podcast with your friends and family. Please take care. Have a great rest of your day and rest of your week. 
and I'll see you next time at the next episode of Friends and Fellow Citizens. See you next time.